The night Peregrine's brother Jacob walked into the Whitetail National Forest after his senior prom, she couldn't have imagined that he would never make it back home alive. Two years later, on the morning of the final, knowing everything she had come to know about the dangers of these woods and the risk of the task at hand, Peregrine still couldn't have imagined she was going to lose another person she loved. I'm told she had the biggest smile on her face when Hal walked her, Eric, and Woodsley out into the forest. I didn't see it myself, because sometimes when you make a plan, Mother Nature covers it in two feet of snow at O'Hare International. Everything I had learned from Sandra Howland Pierce looked like it, too, might remain buried under that snow. And under my own blind belief that there was an inherent goodness in the man who found Jacob Wells, who loved Gerda Polnick, who took Peregrine under his wing when she had nowhere else to turn. I didn't want to believe that that man would let someone die. I'm Brett Ryback, and this is In Strange Woods. Chapter 5. The Final. This morning, she was just pacing around, you know, triple-checking her stuff. And, well, I think it was more excitement than nerves. She was laser-focused at the send-off. You know, didn't let any of the cheer in. I spoke with Kathy at her house around noon on February 13th, 2017, the day of the final. I had landed an hour after the ceremonial send-off. Oh, you would have been proud. Really proud. I don't know what you would have thought of me, though, I swear. I didn't know how to explain to Kathy about where I had been, what I had learned. I couldn't shake Sandra's story about what happened at Helion, but it was hard to untangle the facts from the family drama. He is an evil man, and he will let you die out of spite, and he will call it principle. And Kathy was feeling good about how the morning had gone. Earlier threats of an incoming storm seemed to be fading away. And she was generally hopeful about how the next day or two might play out for the teens. Just got to tell the worried voices in your head to be quiet sometimes, you know, just shh. (laughs) Kathy had wanted a bit of alone time after the send-off, so she didn't join the others for brunch at the Greystone Diner. Do you think they were ready? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at some point, you just got to go for it. John Francis was officially ungrounded. Dropping out of the final was enough for his father, Donald, to stand down. So he was able to be out there cheering for Peregrine, Woodsley, and Eric, alongside their families and a sizable crowd of white tailors. The O'Connor clan came out in full force, too. It just gets harder and harder to bring people together around anything these days. So it's nice to see a real gathering out there. Although, I'm not sure Peter Howard would agree, but... Why is that? Well, you know, Peter, he just looks so miserable the whole time, just scowling and sulking, but... Yeah, no, I guess it's good he's taking it seriously. I mean, someone ought to. This is our children's lives we're talking about. When the sun had marked 8 a.m. on the blustery but bright day, Howell and the teens set off. They marched east, away from their friends and family, out into the wooded maze. They had a long day of hiking ahead, and though they didn't know it yet, an even longer night. Feel the roots, feel the rush in your body when you... In theory, it would take them about six hours to hike 14 miles in the woods. At that point, they'd start to file off one by one. First up, feel the power in your core. Howell would direct Eric to walk 1,500 paces north. The others would continue on to mile 15 where Woodsley would then head 1,500 paces south. Three, stay loose, feel the wind flowing through you when you... At mile 16, Hal would split off from Peregrine. They'd each make provisions for a night in the woods and then work their way home in the morning. Four, break down, take every weakness down to the floor. Push into the fear until it shatters. There is me where you're gonna shatter. I'm moving the goal up, I'm coming up every wall. I'm giving control up. I'm willing to take the fall Make it love and crack, it doesn't matter Never gonna stop until we By marching the teens so far out then sending them off in opposing directions they'd be disoriented by design 
If the sky stayed clear, they'd have the sun to help them find their way back the next morning. Beyond that, they could lean on their sense of dead reckoning. If done right, they would remember landmarks from their hike out and use those as guides to navigate their way home. There were a lot of ifs, and Hal's teachings should have made it obvious that the odds weren't in the team's favor. But hope can be like a cloud, blocking out better judgment, liable to break at any moment. Make another crack, it doesn't matter. Never gonna stop until we shatter it all. Around here, folks call it a Canadian clipper. It's a common storm pattern this time of year, and the latest reports had one veering off to the northeast of Whitetail, dropping some overnight flurries on the forest at worst. But as the day grew colder by the hour, the sky turned dark. The winds had changed. Had Howell expected this? I kept trying to anticipate some X factor that no one else was considering. If Peter Howland saw these kids as a stand-in for his long-growing disgust with the people of Whitetail, or society altogether, then in the privacy of the woods he could act with impunity, the natural risks of the situation a perfect cover. I agonized over what to say and to whom, but as evening approached and tree branches shivered and whipped against my window, the time for hypothetical concern was running out. Because what we didn't know was As soon as the sky turned gray That's when I knew the plan was shot Lexi hadn't gone to the morning send-off She'd been keeping her distance from the group Ever since John Francis broke his wrist But her friends were clearly still on her mind I tried not to worry all day But now the snow keeps falling I can't just sit around and watch The storm began in earnest around 5 p.m. Lexi immediately sprung into action while the rest of us clung to hopeful excuses. The snow was rising, and we only knew what we knew. When your own baby's out there hiking in the woods, and there's a blizzard, nasty blizzard, you wish that you could go and help them. But clearly, that's not an option now. Irene was scared. So were Eric's parents and Kathy. But they found some comfort in the fact that they had made sure the teens packed for exactly these conditions. Peregrine couldn't fight me on the logic of it goal was to find your way when you're lost not freeze to death for no reason so they don't have a compass or a cell phone or any of that but they got jackets and tarp but Lexi saw a different threat what would happen after the storm because what we didn't know was it's not just about making it through the night it's about dead reckoning when they wake up in the morning after the wind and the snow things are going to look different Their landmarks won't be the same. Their chances of finding a path home go way down. Hal certainly would have known this. The question is, when did he know it? And could he have turned the group around in time? Sheriff Porter thinks that they'll be fine with what they packed. That's why I called John Francis. He knows why we have to act. The walls of snow, the fallen trees, they'll walk in circles till they freeze. So together, Lexi and John Francis formulated a plan. They needed a team, and they needed to wait until the storm passed. They tried to stay calm, wind and snow howling through the night, their imaginations running wild with what their friends might be going through, alone, in the woods. We lost the sun early, when we were all still together, but after we broke off, I... I think that's when I knew for sure it was going to be a storm. That's when I got a little scared. I spoke to Peregrine two days after she made it out alive. She was raw, still processing. Take me up to that point. So you're all together, you leave the crowd behind that first morning. And we walk for a long time. In almost total silence. And what are you thinking while you walk? This is harder than I thought it would be. So then you each separate and you're alone. How are you feeling? I'm feeling really tired. I mean, I just hiked all that way. Then within the hour, I felt the first bit of snow and it's like, it hits me how stupid of an idea this was. 
I keep thinking about how Eric and Woodsley are out there, somewhere, about to be crushed by it, too. And everyone back home just worried and, and helpless. It's not that I don't think they can handle it. I know they've worked hard to get ready for anything, but this storm... What happens out there if I let them walk back? If I let them walk back alone? I know they prepared, but you can't prepare for that. And if they don't make it home... Lexi insists she understands the risks, but that they'll bring supplies and enough people for a proper search and rescue team. And this is the point, right? If we were better prepared as a community, we would have gotten to Jacob sooner. One second I'm looking for kindling, and then the next I'm ducking behind a tree with snow just thrashing down from every direction. We've got a whole team. Woodsy's brother Shannon is coming with us, Eric's dad, Aunt Kathy, and you'll be there. I don't remember explicitly agreeing to be part of the rescue mission, but I guess we're past that. Well, the way Lexi put it, I mean, how hard it would be for them to find their way, I just, I can't wait it out this time. Not again. I keep having flashes of Eric and Woodsley and and wondering where they are and if they're okay. And the snowdrifts just keep getting higher and higher. They need us now out there. They need us now out there. They need us now out there. Oh, out there. And this time we will find them. My body gave out. I was so exhausted. I fell asleep at some point, I guess. I don't really remember. That night feels so long ago now. The storm finally let up around 4 a.m. the next morning. Within a couple of hours, Lexi and John Francis assembled their team. They knew they could use Howell's help, but he wasn't due back from the woods for at least another half a day. They couldn't wait that long. They set a course into the forest along a frozen tributary of the Whitetail River. Their hope was that the landscape would push the wandering teens towards the riverbed and that we might be able to receive them there. It's not as cold as I expected. No, sir. The search team spans a wide range of skill and temperament. There's the younger folks, John Francis, Lexi, Woodsley's brother Shannon, and the adults, Donald, Kathy, Eric's dad Fordham, and me. Yeah, I did. Yeah, on a full tank, I can get at least uh, 200 miles on the yeah. sidewinder, so it uh, shouldn't be too bad. Yeah, you take them out in the backwoods? Well, well not, not, not in the backwoods necessarily. Yes, Donald Van Kalkar is coming with us and bringing his favorite snowmobile. John Francis's only chance of being allowed to go on this mission was to get Donald on board. He convinced his dad with a bit of his own medicine. I told him, Pops, there's a prize for proper living. Proper living means you stand. When your neighbor needs a hand, you find a way. (laughs) Okay. There's a prize for proper living. Proper living builds a debt. Do your part, they won't forget. And someone's always gonna pay. We all good? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, ready to go. All right, let's go. Keep an eye on the person in front of you and watch your feet around deep snow. I woke up in a daze. I knew the snow was a huge problem, but something about it, it's weird, but like, I had this feeling Jacob was there with me. Yeah? Because I was lost, like, actually, like he had been. And it was horrible, and that made me think about Eric and Woodsley again, and how, like, you know, this isn't what they signed up for, so... That's when I decided I had to go look for them first, before anything else. I owed them that. Each of the teens could have walked anywhere that morning, but Peregrine sensed they'd all head to the same place. What stood out to you about that clearing? Well, it was the last time we were all together. Howell said we had made it 14 miles, and he was about to send Eric off, but then... And... This is why I was sure they'd remember it, because Howell noticed this patch of striped coral root, like deep red-purple stems, and he just walked up to it and stared at it. 
And we had hiked about six or seven hours with almost no breaks. So Eric and Woodsley and I looked at each other like, what is he doing? And then Howell stops and, and he turns around and he starts telling us about this dream that he had where his two sisters were standing at this clearing by the coral root and they told him that the night was going to be colder than expected so to wear two pairs of socks. I didn't even know he had sisters. Peregrine was confident Woodsley and Eric would share her instinct that morning after the storm, remembering that spot and seeking it out. She lifted her boots through a foot of snow, towards what she hoped was the direction of the clearing, hiking deeper into a vast ocean of green and brown and white. Oh, no. You know, I don't, I don't want Eric to think we don't have faith in him to find his way back. You know, I think it's great what they did. Eric's dad, Fordham, has a thick gray mustache and an impressive head of hair that blends in with the snow-covered landscape. He's a broader version of his son, and he's the only one of the adults who seems to be in serviceable shape for this mission. But uh, we'll find him. You know, I keep checking the river still over there on my left like it's going to move or something. You know, I'm just glad we got... Uh, Kids tried to tell him the snowmobile was a bad idea. Yeah, it just doesn't seem too keen on taking advice. Miles away, trudging through drifts, Peregrine hiked three or four miles in what she thought was the direction of the clearing where they were last all together. I'm walking southwest, I think, at this point. Uh, and there was a ridge that could, couldn't have been more than a mile from the clearing, but I'm not seeing it. As time passed... She knew something was off. Every few minutes, she would shut her eyes to avoid feeling lightheaded. When she'd reopen them, she could briefly see the landscape for what it was before it all blended together again. It was alarming and isolating and still very, very cold. The moss on the bottom of a tree A ridge in the distance, a flash of despair it's a colorless echo of the world you've known. The forest fades to ice and smoke. It surprised Peregrine how quickly she began to feel this powerful tug of desperation. If this is what I'm going through, what about them? Like, why did I put them through this? I left them alone, 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 cold and scared and shattered. Eventually you found it? Yeah. And no one was there. It's uh, 3.15 p.m. We've been hiking for about five hours. It's... It's a lot. <clears throat> Our homegrown search party is feeling the weight of its inexperience and the excess of equipment and supplies we brought along. We take a break to eat by the river. You can see the silhouette of yellow pike swimming beneath the ice. We have turkey sandwiches. Oh, gosh. Feet are screaming at me. You better believe it. You guys are doing great. I just wish we knew if we were getting any closer. Yeah, I'm trying to split up and spread out a bit, but the, you know, the dang machine can't handle a few bumps. It's not about that, Dad. Oh, oh, really, Mr. Scoutmaster, really? What, what he means is we need to stay along the river so we don't get lost. We'd end up going in circles otherwise, snowmobile or not. Mm -hmm. They'll be looking for drinking water, too, I bet. Oh, God. I didn't even think about them running out of water with, with everything else to worry about. <sighs> Lexi and John Francis share a look. They know it's their job to play parent out here. Actually, Aunt Kathy, they've got a good handle on how to address their immediate needs. They'll know how to keep themselves going. Yeah. 
Do you guys know about the rule of threes? No? Okay, this is a good one to know. Repeat after me. You can survive three minutes without air. Three, three minutes without air. Three hours without shelter. Three hours without shelter. Nice. Three days without water. I'm at the clearing, and I've got a little shelter at the edge, so I'm waiting there for maybe two, three hours. And I know it'll get dark soon, and it could always start snowing again. But then out of the corner of my eye, I see a wolf. Probably 40 feet past the coral root. I could just make out the outline of him. And I'm keeping a close watch, you know, trying not to move too much, and then he starts approaching. And his ears are pointed straight up, and we're staring each other down. And then suddenly his eyes go wide, and he makes this little yelp, and he runs off. And I hear rustling behind me, and I, I turn around slowly, thinking it's a bear. And then I hear his voice shouting out my name and running at me. Woodsley had the same idea Peregrine did after all. It just took him a little longer to get there. I give him this massive hug, like the biggest hug I've ever given anyone. And it feels like home, like home, like home. Together we'll get through this. The joy of the moment is gone as quickly as it came. Well, Woodsley had had an awful first two days. He said his tarp didn't stay up, and his pack got a rip in it, so that's why his clothes and his socks got wet. And he hadn't seen Eric anywhere. With only a couple hours of muted daylight left, Peregrine and Woodsley decide to spend the night in the clearing, hoping against their better judgment that Eric will find them there before morning. Stay tuned for more after the break. When they stay focused and don't let panic take over, they're actually doing pretty good. Yeah. For a bunch of grandpas. <laughs> <laughs> Lexi and John Francis are sharing a tent. It's a complicated fusion of romantic tension, deep exhaustion, and quiet fear. Night has arrived quickly on our first day of searching. We still don't have any leads on Peregrine, Eric, or Woodsley. You were lugging this around the whole time? <laughs> well, that's mom's strength right there. She stays on the lower back. If you say so, I feel it in my... Donald and Kathy sit by the fire comparing their packs. They're almost delirious in their fatigue. It's charming. Oh, well, you know, there's no point in acting like you could have done more in a day when you couldn't. Yeah, I hear that. What would my cousin say if she saw us out here like this? <laughs> well, she she checked me for a fever, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> she thought we were out of our minds when we left this morning. <laughs> she was right. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to find Peregrine. You know that. We're going to find all of them. That's right. I had to let her try. I know. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 all right, all right, come, come here, come here now, come here. <laughs> oh, come on, it's all right, it's all right. <laughs> We're ready this time, right? <laughs> it's gonna be okay. Her third day in the woods, Peregrine woke up at the first hint of light. I open my eyes, and Woodsley's already got beans going on a fire. And he's trying to be funny, so he does this whole mom thing. Like, good morning, sweetie, and did you sleep well? Time to get ready for school. <laughs> Ugh, so stupid. But uh, his voice is, like, really shaky, and, and he keeps coughing. And you can tell he's cold, but we had to leave soon. Why did you want to leave the clearing? I thought, like, wherever Eric is, if he hasn't found us yet, then we need to go find him. How? 
Well, I noticed that the land is sloping in one direction, and usually that's a path toward water. So I'm thinking maybe, maybe Eric will head that way too, assuming he's anywhere nearby. Woodsley agrees, and, and so we move out. And you're feeling... Hopeful. Miles of trees away, the search and rescue team arose with distinctly less pep and purpose. John Francis has a small fire going for coffee. His father insisted. My rule of threes has coffee in it. Three hours without caffeine, somebody's going to die. Lexi tries to rally the group to get us moving, but it's not easy. I am ready to go when the rest of you are. So what exactly is the difference of this part of the river or five miles down the river? I mean, they don't know where we are either way, right? I'm just saying, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to, to lose my knees for nothing. Dad, we haven't even gone far enough in yet. If one of them tripped and got hurt, Oh, then... oh okay, so now what? Well, now we're trying to save them from tripping over their own feet? You don't have to do that, Donald. Do what? Mr. Van Kalkar, it's okay. We'll go when you're ready. Oh, okay. I'm holding everybody up. I'm Donald, the problem. That's not what I mean. No I'm good seeing. deed, I tell you. No good deed with you people. No good deed. Donald walks off in a huff. He catches himself before he goes too far. He broods from a safe distance. The rest of us finish packing up camp quietly. It feels like when you can't shake off a nightmare, like all day. I mean, you're so sure you're headed in one direction and then you see the same group of trees that you passed an hour before and your brain starts to overload and and shut down. It's terrible. Peregrine's instincts about the slope of the land were wrong. They haven't found the river, and Woodsley can't stop shivering. I remember thinking that we actually might never find our way out, let alone find Eric. And Woodsley's having a lot of trouble keeping up, so I tell him, you know, maybe he should stay there, and I'll go try to find a landmark we can identify, but he thinks that's a bad idea for us to split up, and he's fighting me on it, and then all of a sudden he stops talking. And he's looking past me with huge eyes, And I turn around to see what he's looking at. And it's a wolf. And I want to say it's it's the same one from before, but he starts walking towards us. And we're barely breathing. And and it felt like a lifetime. And he's inches away. And then he just passes right in between us and walks ahead. And in that moment, I realized that the wolf might be looking for water, too. And anything feels like something at this point, so we follow. I just wonder if that was my last chance, you know? And if I should have been thinking about... I I was just so distracted and overwhelmed, and um, I... You know, I'm the one who made him go out there, so... You didn't make anyone do anything. But I did. Brett, I did. This was my idea, right? It's so much more complicated than that. I probably always think about it. What if, like, what could I have done? You keep saying nothing, but that can't be the answer. I can't believe he's gone. Cause I swore that after Jacob, I'd be smarter. I'd be bigger than those woods Should have let him be Should have spared him when I could You were doing what you thought was right Yeah, well, good intentions don't just take away responsibility That's not how it works And maybe you should think about that too Instead of acting like you didn't have anything to do with anything Like you didn't encourage this Pear, I... That, that's not... What I mean, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, Brett. I. It's okay. It's okay. I'm sorry. When you comfort a grieving friend, you tell them that whatever happened, it's not their fault. No matter the specifics, no matter what your logic brain wants to say. I think it's a self-defense mechanism for the next time you're the one grieving. Your body stores those comforting words away as a salve to apply whenever you wonder if you could have called more, could have been with them that night, could have prompted them to keep their eyes on the road. 
Peregrine wasn't alone in her grieving, and in many ways she wasn't wrong about me. I was keeping myself on the outside, where it felt safe, where I didn't have to wrestle with the impact of the things I did or didn't say to the people of Whitetail over the past five months. A few days before that conversation, tempers cooled amongst our search and rescue team after Donald had his coffee and we were reluctantly ready to continue our trek up the river. So how do you think it's been going this morning? Slow start, but every mile counts. You think we're close? Can't think about that. (laughs) Yeah, I know. (laughs) Lexi is in front, John Francis holds up the rear, and the rest of the crew droops in the middle. We're uncomfortable, cold, and worst of all, losing hope. How you guys doing up there? The path begins to slope upward, and I've never been so aware of the force of gravity on my legs. We slowly crest the hill. Then I nearly have a heart attack when Fordham lets out a sudden, primal yell. Hey! Oh my god. Hey! What's, 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 hey! what's going on? What? Are you okay? And then we see them. It's Pear! Shane's down there! Oh and then we are the fastest people on earth. We run full force with our arms up and out towards two figures that slowly come into focus Peregrine and Woodsley. Oh my. Oh my God. You guys are right? Oh my God. John Francis picks up Woodsley like he's a trophy. Oh, there he is. There he is. You guys check around here often? Sorry, Mom. I can't Kathy hugs Peregrine and will not let her go until Lexi finally steals her away. You're okay. You did this. Yeah. The two girls hold each other tight. If they're feeling anything like I am, they are overwhelmed with joy and utter shock. We embrace this moment as long as we can until the excitement inevitably settles. No one needs to say his name to feel the weight of Eric's absence. The teen's training kicks right back in. No tracks? Nothing? No. uh, We thought he'd head for water. Yeah, same. Our incredibly tired contingent starts to process the fact that our search isn't over. The teens consider alternative routes based on what Pear and Woodsley have seen. Fordham is standing at the top of the hill looking out into the forest. But no matter how hard he looks... He will not find his son. Because what we didn't know was... In terms of the final itself, no one else completed it but me. Call it luck, call it skill, Eric made it all the way home by himself. Pear hates it when I say that. She claims she would have made it. But frankly, that's not a guarantee. On the evening of the storm, Eric was able to find a big enough drift to carve out a snow shelter for himself. It held through the night. The next morning, he tried to go to the clearing, too, but he couldn't find it. That's when he spotted an oddly shaped boulder that he remembered from the hike out, then a creek that wrapped around a line of spruce, and he began to navigate a path. He spent a second night alone in the woods, then hiked the rest of the way home in the morning, arriving around 10 a.m. His mom drove him to the sheriff's office, and he and Sheriff Porter tried to reach us on our satellite phone. They finally made contact after we had joined up with Woodsley and Pear. Kathy answered the call. Hello? We don't see you yet. What? Who's this? Who's this? It's Eric. Oh my god, Eric! Where are you? I'm at the sheriff's office. I'm I'm home. Oh my god. Eric, you're a father of Fordham! Fordham, it's Eric! Oh my god. Did did you find them? What? Peregrine and Woodsley, did you find them? Oh, yeah, yeah, honey, we got them, we got them, but... That's amazing, that's... Well, there's oh been an God, issue that's... with... When will you be back? We... Well, we had to call in a medevac, what? honey. The, the copter's trying to find us now. Uh, medevac? Why? It's Shane. It's Shane, honey, he's not doing good. Woodsley? What happened? Well, we have to get him back as fast as possible. Why don't you meet us at the hospital, okay? We'll be there soon. Here, here, talk uh, to your dad. Here, here you go. Here. okay. Hey, buddy. Hey, Dad. Hey. How you doing? You okay? None of us were in the right state of mind to process the fact that Eric was home, that our search was now over. An hour or so earlier, we had attempted to continue hiking up the river in search of him, but we had to stop. 
that blanket, get that blanket. Woodsley okay. kept falling. You okay, buddy? He was extremely short of breath, shaking and confused. No matter what we did, we couldn't get him warm. And then he stopped shivering altogether and started fading in and out of consciousness. When Eric's call came, we were waiting for a helicopter to arrive. Eventually, they found us and lifted Woodsley out. The rest of us hiked to the nearest driving path and were picked up and brought to the hospital. We met Eric there, as well as Irene and the rest of the O'Connor family. The lessons learned inside the woods will cost you something dear. For when the paths at last unwind and you have found some peace of mind, a part of you must stay behind forever in the woods. In Strange Woods will return after a short break. At the hospital, the teens try to distract one another with stories from the woods. It feels like we're waiting for hours until finally we get an update. As many of us had suspected, Woodsley got hypothermia. The doctor was sure that if we hadn't brought him to the hospital in the time we did, he very well could have died. But Lexi's decision to send out a search team and keep marching up the river ultimately saved his life. The teens immediately disregard doctor's orders and swarm Woodsley's room with Irene and Declan. I can hear them laughing and shouting from down the hall. I wait in the lobby with the other parents. And I'll tell you straight, Brett. Um, those kids? Nah, 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 kids ain't the right word. Those young men and women... What they did, what they endured, I ain't seen anything harder than that out there. No limit to what they can do now. No limit. I breathe out for what feels like the first time in three days. I almost turn off my mic. But then Peregrine comes out into the waiting room and asks me a question that ought to have been completely innocuous. Hey, hey. do you want to come with us to go see Howell tonight? Sure, yeah. That'd be great. Nice! Oh, we did it! <laughs> you, you did it. I can't... But what we didn't know was... We wouldn't find Peter Howland at his cottage that night. Amidst the emotional wave of the past 48 hours, no one had thought to ask whether or not he made it back home. We assumed, I guess, that Howell, of all people, would have been able to find his way back without any problem, despite having hiked 16 miles with the teens, far from any trail, and gotten stuck in the same blizzard they all had, with even fewer supplies on hand. You want to believe that the fight will be fair, that someone will come or that someone will care. Howell would likely laugh at our assumptions how we still hadn't grasped the power of nature and how small we were in its wake. How unbelievably lucky we had gotten to recover the others and how foolish we'd been to think we deserved that luck. That's the mark of a man who cannot be saved. When we arrived at Howell's empty cottage that first night back, we thought up a million reasons why he might not be there. When he was still nowhere to be found the next day, we started to catch up with reality. Peregrine went to the sheriff's office. She asked me if we could help her put together a search team. I sort of let her talk herself out of it. She knew as well as anybody that we'd missed our window and that her friends were in no shape to go back out there. I promised we'd send a copter. Sheriff Porter's aerial search was fruitless. He called it off after four days. As hard as it was to grasp, Howell was gone. Lost to the wilderness, like so many before him. Life is disappointment. It affects you because you have the opposite expectation. You expect everything should work out in your best interest. You're a good person. You deserve it. But nature doesn't care about your expectations. There is no good or bad, no pleading with nature. 
and all the stories of his past that had vexed me, they were gone too. I called Hal's cousin Sandra to deliver the news. She let out a long sigh. I guess it's finally over, she said. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, it, it does, of course. This is the way the world actually works. There's no justice or karma or good or bad. It's just meaningless pain. When I first met Peregrine almost a year earlier, she was clearly still grieving for her brother. She worked hard to channel that grief into the idea of the final and into Howell himself. It felt safe there until now. I know that feeling. Any of us could have died out there, but how? I can't see it. I can't picture him out there hurt or lost. Unless that's not what happened. But that is what happened. What if he made a choice? What do you mean? To die? Or to leave? Like he chose to abandon us? It wouldn't be about us. Howell told me about the- I told Peregrine about the night Howell showed me the photos of him and Gerda, about the letter I had seen at Sandra's, how he left the one person he loved because he couldn't handle the peace, the purity, the vulnerability. Maybe this is the same thing again. I don't get it. I feel like I'm this curse, like... Like anything I touch or love is cursed and it's, it's just going to keep happening again and again and again. When I lost my parents, everyone was comforting and understanding for about a month. And then it all shifted to helping me move on. There's no respect for their memory. Like, no one really cares. Yeah. And the idea of just putting it behind you feels foolish. Because the moment you're happy again, it just... Exactly. When you're used to the trees When you're used to the chaos of clouds hanging over your head Something sad never stops feeling sad Something sad feels like home When you're almost okay When you're almost the person you knew Who could smile again Something good never stays feeling good Something good feels like Feels like tricking your brain To believe that the pain won't come back again It comes back again But what if right now with loved ones around We decided to let some light in We'd be stronger the next time a blizzard begins In a clearing, in a clearing, in a break from the trees, in the arms of someone. In a clearing, in a clearing, you can feel a little touch of the sun. When you used to alone. To assuming that no one else knows what you know Someone's love feels impossibly good Someone's love feels like home Someone's love feels like home The trees are still there So we have to prepare to go back again We'll go back again so we won't pretend that the suffering ends We'll remember the places we've been While we breathe for a beat And let healing begin In a clearing, in a clearing In a break from the trees In the arms of 
And that would have been where this story ended. Except, there's one thing I haven't shared. I wasn't sure if I ever would. But then something changed. She's a chem major, so I never see her. She's a lot neater than I am, in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> it felt right to tell Peregrine first. Um, this is our fridge. Nice. Pretty much everyone on the floor uses it. Oh my god, it's packed. <laughs> right? <laughs> in the fall... I go to see Peregrine during her first semester at college in St. Paul. She's on a path to double major in poli-sci and anthropology. We sit down together in her dorm room. Is everything okay? Yeah, yeah. So, do you remember Gerda Polnick? The woman Howell was in love with who gave him the cottage when she passed? Yeah. So, I wanted to tell you that Gerda Polnick is actually my great aunt. Oh. Wow. Did you find that out after? Or? No, no. Um, no, I knew. I knew going in. Like, before we met? I hadn't exactly thought through how Peregrine would feel about the fact that I had been withholding this information. That I had this other connection to Howell all along. Yeah, that's why I came to Whitetail. To find out more about Gerda. She was my grandmother's sister. My grandmother who raised us when my parents died. And she was this enigma in our family. So... When I learned that Howell was living on her land. But then I met him and and all of you and and everything happened. That is... uh, I don't really know what to say. At that moment, I reach into my bag and hand Peregrine a photo that's been torn in two. When Howell was presumed dead... The deed to the land returned to the next of Gerda's living kin. Me. I spent days searching the house for answers, including in Howell's lockbox, the one where he kept his homemade brandy, and Gerda's photos. I came across a torn photo and recognized it instantly. Howell had shown it to me before. Oh my gosh. (laughs) He looks so young. He looks so happy. It was the picture of Howell and Gerda together on a beach in Alexandria. But the half with Gerda had been torn off. On the back of the photo is an inscription in Howell's handwriting. Peregrine squints to read it. Peregrine, you can't change what happened. She reads it to herself again, turns it back over, examines it closely like she's waiting for it to say more. Do you think this means he... Could be, yeah. Where's the other half? I don't know. I was thinking maybe he took it with him. Maybe he wants you to find it. Yeah, maybe. But then again, I've got a really big midterm coming up, so... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
throughout the rest of the year, I go up to Whitetail about once a month, slowly tending to some repairs on the cottage. It's a nice place to write. Oh, they're all doing so good. Just so good. You know, I think they all- Peregrine's high school graduation photo now hangs in Kathy's living room, right next to the photo from Jacob's hockey game and a framed local news article about when the kids fought off the bear. Kathy sits on her couch, the carpeted staircase behind her leading up to two empty bedrooms. I didn't think it'd be this quiet. That's for sure. That was a surprise. I'm trying not to bug her, you know, keeping myself busy. Give her space to live her life. I just want her to feel like if she needs to, she can always go. That no matter what, I'll be there through it all. I'll be like a compass in her drawer. Lord knows she doesn't need my help. But all the same, that's what I'm for. When something happens, come and find me. Come and find me. I'll help get you through. If you're in trouble, come and find me. You come and find me. We'll know what to do. After the final, the teens' lives started to diverge naturally. In the spring, while John Francis's wrist was healing, Lexi would come over to help him study. They started dating just before graduation. Despite the injury, John Francis secured a track scholarship after all. Donald says he was never worried. But that meant John Francis was off to Boston while Lexi was headed to Chicago for a pre-law program. They promised they would stay together. They haven't. Eric has stayed closer to home. He goes to Cass Lake Technical College, about 30 miles from downtown Whitetail. He and Woodsley hang out most weekends, along with Eric's new boyfriend, Mark. They met in welding class. Yeah, I heard there were sparks. <laughs> Shut up. As for Woodsley, to the wonderful surprise of his friends and family, he was named homecoming king in the fall of his senior year. First O'Connor to wear the crown. Well, yeah, let's not forget who got him there. He had a lot of help from a certain mother who ought to be proud of herself. Eh? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, he's got big plans for next year, too. And I, oh, I, I'm not supposed to spoil it. I'm, I'm no. going to let him tell you. No spoilers, right? Yeah. Is that what he says? That's what they yeah, say. Yeah. No spoilers. <laughs> At Irene's fourth annual ill-advised turkey drop, Kathy will ask Peregrine what she thinks about her mother transferring hospitals and moving to St. Paul. Peregrine will instantly forget that it isn't cool to be excited about your mom moving closer to you in college. The two will immediately start making plans for all the restaurants they have to eat at together. When something happens, come and find me, come and find me, I'll help get you through. I never thought she'd leave Whitetail, but I'm so proud of her. We do Sunday dinners. She brings her laundry. It's nice to have a lifeline nearby. And when I'm lonely, she'll remind me. Come and find me. Oh, find me. I get lonely too. I get lonely too. But come and find me. And there's nothing we can. During their first Thanksgiving break, the teens all come back home from school. They meet up at Howell's Cottage, now my cottage. They talk about college life and recount the memories of their time together out here. Peregrine digs two small holes where they plant a pair of trees. One for Howell, one for Jacob. The trees will grow tall, like sentinels standing watch over the forest for generations to come. Two landmarks to look to for those who feel lost or alone in the woods.
In Strange Woods is a production of Atypical Artists. The series was created and written by Jeff Lupino Esposito, Brett Ryback, and Matt Sav. The series was directed by Jeff Lupino Esposito, music produced by Matt Sav and Evan Cunningham, and sound designed by Brandon Grugel and Stephen Jensen. In Strange Woods is executive produced by Matt Sav, Brett Ryback, Jeff Lupino Esposito, Lauren Shippen, and Brigham Snow. The series featured performances by Brett Ryback, Lily Mae Harrington, Donalyn Champlin, Patrick Page, Larry Bates, Michaela Watkins, Christian Brune, Jonah Platt, Ryan Alexander Holmes, Lana McKissick, Philip Labus, Brigham Snow, Raymond J. Lee, Lauren Shippen, and Beth Level. With additional performances by Julia Addis, Christian Barrias, Jameson Hayes, Jeff Lupino Esposito, Vanessa Mazzone, Brent Pope, Daniel Robay, and Matt Sav. The series was edited by Lauren Chippen and Jeff Lupino Esposito. Our technical director was Matt Sav. Our production manager was Lillian Holman. The show was mixed and mastered by Evan Cunningham. Musical direction was by Brett Ryback, and our show art is by Carlos Garcia. Our instrumentalists were Andrew Zinsmeister on guitar, banjo, and mandolin, Alex Straley on guitar and bass, Kyle Fair on drums, Evan Cunningham on drums and piano, Kiara Anna Perico on violin and viola, Leah Metzler on cello, and Greg Riley on clarinet. Special thanks to Nick Searley, Stelios Feely, Sam Reader, and Pod Fund. In Strange Woods was recorded at Fairfax Village Studios in West Hollywood, California. This was our final episode. For more information about the cast and crew, please visit instrangewoods.com and keep up with all of Atypical Artist productions at atypicalartist.co. Thank you for listening.